studies are showing that there's over a hundred different diseases that are associated with microbial imbalances. So a microbial imbalance is, um, the name is dysbiosis, meaning lack of balance, right? So that means that you either don't have enough of the good microbes or enough of like a variety of the good microbes, or you have a lot of the bad ones. You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 146. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well-being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Well, hi, veggie lovers. Welcome back to Veggie Doctor Radio. So happy to have you here today. And I hope that you have had a fantastic week. Another fabulous episode for you today. I have Dr. Vanessa Mendez, who is returning to the podcast. She originally was on the podcast in episode number 127. So if you haven't listened to that episode and you're interested in fatty liver disease, she has a great episode on that. We talk about what it is, what kind of things you can do to prevent it, potentially even reverse it. And also talk more in depth about her plant-based journey. So if you want to hear more from Dr. Mendez, head over to episode 127 after you listen to this episode. In addition, I just wanted to point out that in this episode, we talk a little bit about food allergies in children, but if you want more information on that, I have two really great episodes. They're back-to-back episodes. Episode number 82 with Dr. David Stukas and episode 83 with Dr. Manisha Raylan. Really great episodes on food allergies and allergies in general in children. But today we will be hearing from Dr. Vanessa Mendez, and this episode is going to be focused on the gut microbiome in general, but we're also going to be talking about specifically the gut microbiome in children. So Dr. Vanessa Mendez is a double board certified gastroenterologist and internist. She specializes in digestive disorders, which includes liver disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and nutrition-based disorders such as obesity and constipation. Her approach to patients and their diseases is holistic and comprehensive. Her goal is not just to treat the symptoms, but to get to the root cause of an ailment and provide lasting relief. She provides an evidence-based approach to her practice and focuses on lifestyle changes first to promote wellness. She also serves as the Director of International Relations for the nonprofit Planted in Health. She is passionate about grassroots community outreach and community-based programs that transform health through a culturally sensitive approach. And you can find Dr. Vanessa Mendez at her website, Dr. Vanessa Mendez, that's drvanessamendez.com on Instagram at plant-based gut doc and also on Facebook at Dr. Vanessa Mendez. So like I said, this episode is about the gut microbiome in children. So we talk about what it is, especially if you aren't really clear on what your microbiome is composed of, how we know that it's working the way it should be, what are some signs that there might be some trouble, what are the early life influencers to the gut microbiome. There's a lot of things probably that you didn't even realize affect the microbiome from before your child is even born what parents can do to foster a healthy gut microbiome in their children. This includes lifestyle habits and different foods. And what are some things that we probably should avoid? 
We also talk about what can be done if we feel that the gut microbiome has become unfavorable or unbalanced and how quickly it can change. We talk about probiotics because, you know, probiotics, one of those things we were really into for a while. Is it still the right thing to do to supplement with probiotics? Should we be sending our poop to these companies that analyze our poop and what she wishes more people knew about the gut microbiome? It's an excellent episode. I think she is such a great teacher and teaches us some really great nuggets of information that I know are going to help you in your life optimization. Veggie lovers, thank you so much for being here today. Let us welcome back Dr. Vanessa Mendez. Dr. Vanessa Mendez, welcome back to Veggie Doctor Radio. Hi, Yami. Thank you so much for having me back. I loved our first session and I can't wait to dig deeper into the microbiome and how to optimize kids' health. Yes, let's do it. Okay, so let's start with why are you even so passionate about the gut microbiome in children to begin with? Yeah, so, um, you know, this is another topic that we don't get taught about um, in in our medical training or anything like that. So uh, when I got pregnant with our little one, his name is Emmy, and now he just turned two years old. When I got pregnant with him, um, there was a lot I didn't know. And I'm kind of like, um, I, I can be OCD about certain things, but I'm, I was pretty laid back during my pregnancy. Um, tried to, you know, eat healthy, tried to get exercise in, but otherwise I was just uh, very laid back. And, um, you know, I went through my pregnancy as I, as I was finishing my training, my fellowship training. And then uh, the last couple of months of my, of my pregnancy were actually when I started my, my attending position as a, you know, as an at a training physician. So it was pretty hectic. I was actually doing uh, up to 18 procedures per day for GI, for gastroenterology, like endoscopic procedures, endosc- upper endoscopies and colonoscopies, doing up to 18 procedures per day until the day I went into labor, um, which is completely fine because I, I felt fine, you know, but um, <laughs> that I'm just leading you into kind of like a picture of how, you know, I went into into my delivery. So I went into my delivery. I wanted to, um, you know, do it as natural as possible. So I had done Lamas classes. I had done like um, breathing classes, birthing classes, all that sort of stuff. And uh, alongside with my husband. And then um, we went into labor. And, um, and when we went into labor, we went into labor two weeks early. And then um, basically... Uh, from the moment that I arrived at the hospital, they wanted to like induce me. Um, I had tested GBS positive, which, you know, a lot of women may know that basically means that you have, uh, that you're a carrier for like a bacteria on your skin or in your vagina that mm, doesn't cause symptoms, may not cause symptoms otherwise. And I didn't have any symptoms throughout my pregnancy, but it predisposes you to, you know, possibly, um, uh, that bacteria to cross over um, if your water breaks. So my water broke first, which was what I dreaded. And um, and because I knew that was like a ticking time bomb in terms of how physicians would approach it. If I had just started my contractions first and my water had been broken, then it would have been fine. But um, my water broke and then I we went to the hospital and then they wanted to induce me right away. And there was a lot of fear um, that they would put, you know, that they basically uh, put onto me um, and on like meaning, you know, you have a certain amount of time, like 24 hours from the time your water breaks until, you know, we can get your baby out because it could. And there, there's certainly evidence for that. There is. But I think that the way that a lot of um, the whole birthing process is approached can cause a lot of anxiety and mm-hmm. stress for parents. And um, so I have, I certainly have trauma. So anyway, long story short, I was um, 30 hours in labor um, and I tried to do it like naturally. I didn't even want an epidural at first because I felt like I could tolerate the pain with uh, breathing exercises, but I didn't progress quickly enough. Um, And uh, basically by hour 24, they, they told me, you know, we have to induce you and then they, they, in order to give me, you know, the medications to 
accelerate the contractions and the birthing process, um, I was like, okay, at this point, I've been in labor for 24 hours. I cannot take the contractions anymore. So I asked for the epidural at that time. Got the epidural, got the Pitocin to uh, accelerate my contractions, make them stronger. And then I did start to progress. But then it ended up being that Emmy was, um, was he kept on hitting like the bridge of his nose against my pelvis and wouldn't come out. So I ended up having a C-section. Um, that's fine. Everything was good. But he was born with low sugar. And then they stuck milk formula in his mouth from the beginning. Like didn't latch him on to me. They, you know, it's part of their protocol. If they have low blood sugar to uh, give them, you know, something right away. So I did not see my baby for like the, like I quickly saw him and then they took him away. And the whole process was extremely stressful. And that certainly doesn't prepare the mom's brain and body to, you know, to lactate. Um, so I had issues with lactation in the beginning. I did see an in-hospital lactation consultant, um, but I didn't continue to see one after I went home. Um, so I was not producing enough milk for my baby. So um, I started supplementing with formula. I didn't seek the help that I needed. I didn't seek the resources that, you know, that are, that are available. Um, and sh- there should be more resources available. And moms really should be educated on all of this before, during, and after giving birth. Um, but even as a physician, you know, I, I, I didn't seek enough and there's certain guilt associated with that. Um, and it made me more aware of the deficiencies we have in our healthcare system, um, when prepping moms for all of this. So in all of this, uh, in all of this story, I started searching, you know, what were the, what were the benefits to lactation? I knew that lactation was the best thing, but what were the benefits and what were the drawbacks to formula feeding and um, all these different methods? So that's when I started searching about the microbiome and how the microbiome really um, helps us w- when the mom gets pregnant, even before she gets pregnant, during pregnancy, during childbirth, and through lactation, and then the first couple years of of baby's life, um, and how that sets up baby's health for for the the rest of his life. So in that search for my knowledge, and imagine none of this was learned during training, nothing about the microbiome was taught about during my GI um, training, even though the microbiome is in the digestive system. So, um, so I took these first two years of his life to really delve deep into this whole um, world of the microbiome and really um, optimize it for him. Um, given, you know, the, the barriers we had at the beginning. Um, so that's where basically all of this passion for, um, the early life influencers when it comes to the gut microbiome and how to develop a healthy microbiome in kids really came about. Yeah. Wow. What a story. And my heart goes out to you because I know how it is when we're pregnant, especially the first time you're pregnant and you have this you visualize how you want your labor to go and the birth and, you know, we romanticize it and often things don't go as planned. (laughs) So especially I think if you're in healthcare, I think it's like one of those things of the universe. You're in healthcare, things are probably not going to go as planned. (laughs) So unfortunately, and lots of things that we can circle back and talk about too in a little bit, but being GBS positive usually means that you're going to get at least one dose of antibiotics in depending on how fast that labor goes, but maybe multiple doses of antibiotics that get transferred over to the baby. Then, you know, you ended up having a C-section. He probably did get a little seated from trying to get down the birth canal, you know, because your water did break, but then he ended up getting taken a different way. So maybe not the full amount of seeding that you would like, and then not able to provide all of his milk uh, via breast, which I got to say, when it comes to, to breastfeeding and nursing, as you've mentioned, there's so much guilt and shame, shame involved with it that I think a lot of moms don't seek help because they feel so ashamed about it. And at the same time, you're tired. You're just worn out. 
you've never done it before. So you don't even know what to expect, what's normal, what's not normal. Should it feel like this or not? So it's just so much going on at once. And you were recovering from a C-section. So there was a lot happening. So my heart goes out to you and sending you a big mama hug from over here, because I know that you probably suffered and struggled those you know first few weeks. Well, well, we can circle back and talk about each one of those little individual things. But before we get more into that, for the listeners that are still new to the gut microbiome, can you define it? What is the gut microbiome? Yeah, absolutely. So let's delve into this wonderful world of the gut microbiome. So basically the gut microbiome, uh, we have microbiomes in different parts of our bodies. We have a microbiome on our skin. um, So that just means microbes that live on our skin and colonize our skin. That's normal and expected. We have uh, microbiome in uh, the airways and we have microbiome, like for example, women have a microbiome in the vagina. The largest by far, the largest microbiome is the gut microbiome which resides in our digestive system. And this microbiome is composed of viruses, bacteria, fungi, eukaryotes, and different organisms that live there. Um, and uh, for example, it, it, it's estimated, we don't know for sure, because everybody's microbiome is completely different. So a point about that, um, the two microbiomes that look the most alike are mom and baby. But as soon as baby starts, for example, eating regular food or starts um, uh, drinking formula, then they start to diverge right away. So um, everybody has a unique gut microbiome. This is made up of all those different microbes, and it's made up of about 39 to 100 trillion microbes in in our gut. And these microbes... um, a lot of them are beneficial, meaning that they live symbiotically together with us. Um, they give us different uh, nutrients, enzymes, and uh, different byproducts. And we, in, in turn, give them a host, right? We give them a body, and we also give them different nutrients back. Um, so basically, what we eat, they eat as well, and they use as, as their energy source. And in turn, they make different products for us. Um, We also have um, what we call pathogenic microbes. All of us have them. There's no way to get rid of them. The only way to get rid of all the pathogenic or bad uh, disease-causing microbes would be to take lots and lots of courses of antibiotics, and that would also get rid of the good ones, so we don't want to do that. So all of us have a balance between the good ones and the bad ones, and what we want to do is Uh, make sure we're empowering the good ones because they in turn actually um, keep the other, the bad ones under control uh, through different mechanisms. One of the mechanisms is that they actually release different particles so that the bad microbes don't adhere to our digestive wall. That's just one of the many ways. And they also compete for nutrients. So like I said, what we eat, they eat as well. So um, they compete with for nutrients and resources within our body. So we want to empower the good ones because we know that that's the best way to ensure we have a good, optimized gut microbiome. And again, that looks completely different for everybody because um, we know that our, our microbiome is also in charge of turning off and turning on different genes. So for example, all of us inherit different genes, right? So um, if you have a certain subset of microbes that turns on certain genes for you, that may not mean the same thing for another person, right? So that interplay between uh, genetics, the environment, everything that we're exposed to, and our gut microbiome is really what is the determinant of health um, for every person. And that is, looks differently for every person. And that's why one of my passions is exploring these patterns of health but also making sure we know what are the limitations when it comes to that. We have a long way to go when it comes to exploring the gut microbiome. This is a field that has really expanded, explosively expanded in the last decade. Um, And new articles are coming out every week when it comes to this, but there's still a lot we don't know. And there's still a lot we can't really say about each specific person. But what we do know is that everybody's microbiome interplay with our genes and our environment is very unique and we can that there's a lot we can work with in terms of that 
Wow. Yeah. That, I love the way that you described it as far as it being a balance, because I think maybe sometimes that's what we don't realize is that they're all there. There's ones that we want to keep the levels low. There's ones that we want to keep the levels higher and, but they're all there. So they're all kind of just in this community together in this interflux. And what I always think of, you know, when you were talking about how everybody's gut microbiome is different, I always think of it and I've heard it described almost as unique as a thumbprint that every person has their own gut thumbprint <laughs> when it comes to all of the little bugs that live in us. And for the most part, we see this as a symbiotic relationship, like we're helping them, they're helping us. There's no way to get rid of them unless we blast them out with a ton of antibiotics and then we'd be in worse trouble. So they're going to be there, might as well make it a happy, beneficial relationship for everybody. Absolutely. So how do we know? So we know now, and like you said, this is a new emerging field, new exciting information that we're learning almost every day about the gut microbiome. So it's become like a hot thing. You know, people talk about your gut microbiome, gut bacteria, da, 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 all this. But how do we know it's working right? How do we know that it's in the place it's supposed to be for us? What are the signs that it's good and we have mostly the beneficial, it's in a good balance? And what might be the signs that maybe there might be something in your gut microbiome that needs to be worked on or, you know, rebalanced? Yeah. So I love this question because um, we have like studies are showing that there's over a hundred different diseases that are associated with microbial imbalances. So a microbial imbalance is um, the name is dysbiosis, meaning lack of balance, right? So that means that you either don't have enough of the good microbes or enough different uh, enough of like a variety of the good microbes, or you have a lot of the bad ones. So that's a called dysbiosis. So there have been over 100 diseases uh, associated with um, dysbiosis or microbial imbalances, and they range from everything. So they range from neurological to, for example, like Parkinson's disease, dementia, Alzheimer's, um, even um, cardiovascular disease. I'm going down as I, as I scan my body. Um, they range from obviously digestive disorders, and we're going to touch upon that too. Um, but also we, we're seeing it when it comes to things like PCOS. Um, there's microbial changes there, uh, chronic conditions, other chronic conditions that are inflammatory like diabetes, obesity, um, most often we see it like in kids in the form of allergies, allergies to different nutrients, uh, to different proteins, um, and, and in skin conditions, things like eczema and, and in older kids, things like psoriasis, acne. So really you name the condition, it's there. We also see it associated with different cancers. So uh, the microbiome is now being used as a, as a form of targeted therapy for different forms of cancers. Um, so really, honestly, <laughs> most classes of diseases have been associated with microbial changes. Um, um, but we see it a lot in these chronic conditions that people suffer from. Um, so when it comes to like my field specifically, um, the digestive system, I see it, it manifest in many different ways. So I see it manifest, for example, the most common way is um, with food intolerances. People say, oh, you know, I have an intolerance to um, tomatoes. I have an intolerance to this. Like they don't agree with me. They cause a lot of bloating. They cause some like GI upset. And then I says, I start to dig deeper. I, I ask them, oh, what, what other conditions do you suffer from? And they're like, oh, no, I'm pretty healthy. Otherwise, okay, do you have migraines? Um, do you have, you know, have you suffered from acne? Do you have this and that? And oftentimes we see it actually correlated with other, other conditions as well that they may not, they may not have thought that were related to each other, but, but all of them actually end up being um, related to a microbial imbalance or dysbiosis. So, Really, I see it all the time, and it can manifest in many, many different ways. Um, but it's you know about really talking to the person and making that connection, and then it starts to click. Oh yeah, you know, 
like I do have all these symptoms and um, I do have food intolerances as well. And then as we navigate through that, then we can really do a lot to optimize and, and actually get them feeling a lot better and not suffering from a lot of these conditions. It's so fascinating. I mean, it's just crazy to think that your gut can be associated with your brain, but we even have information about how this dysbiosis can contribute to things that we think are just like not related, like depression and anxiety and, and things like that. That to me blows my mind. I mean, that's just insane to think about, but but it's true. So when it comes to children in particular, so for parents, if they feel like their child is pretty healthy and thriving, we, I'm sure we're going to talk about tips and how we can maintain a healthy microbiome. But for parents specifically, which ones do you think should be concerned that maybe they have a child that's got some dysbiosis? Obviously, we're talking about food intolerances, maybe rapidly progressing allergies, coming up with new allergies, things like that, chronic abdominal pain. What else would you think of? So yeah, so in kids, honestly, the ones that most parents ask me, and I am not a, a pediatric GI, but I get a lot of patients that I see where they uh, will ask me, you know, just for education about their kids as well. So the most common is is food allergies. I'm seeing that kids are suffering from food allergies more than ever before, and we're gonna talk about how why why that is, right? And it has, goes back to the immune system. That's the other part of the microbiome that is so incredibly exciting, and it's because the microbiome and the digestive system. Um, have a huge impact on the immune system. So 70% of our of our um, immune system actually resides in the digestive system. And there is a very, very thin layer of epithelial cells of these small cells that divides the microbiome in the inner lining of our gut from the immune system, which is on the other side of the epithelial cells inside the body. Right. So there's a constant communication and interplay between the microbes and our immune system. And that interplay, um, and when it comes to the microbiome development, that interplay is crucial to communicating to the immune system whether they should the immune system should tolerate something. It should be immunotolerant to something, meaning it's not gonna attack it, it's gonna recognize it as not not necessarily friend, but nothing, not, not a foe, nothing it needs to attack, right? Um, it, that differentiation when kids, you know, when kids are developing their immune system um, and developing their microbiome is crucial to determining whether p uh, kids are going to develop allergies or not. So for example, let's say, um, let's run through a scenario. A mom like me um, went into, into labor and couldn't have a vaginal birth, which happens to a lot of us, right? Um, had to go through a C-section, got perinatal antibiotics like I had to. I had, um, for more than 24 hours, continuous penicillin uh, administered through my vein because of that GBS positivity that is, is common in a lot of, a lot of women. Um, and the baby uh, was born. Let's say the mother couldn't um, breastfeed at all. She didn't get the support she needed. It was way, it was, it was decided right away by the hospital that the kid was going to take formula feeding and the mom was overwhelmed and like me, didn't seek other help. This is a very common scenario. Then we see the kid, you know, the mom is doing her best. Um, the child is thriving. But then as we start to introduce foods, let's say we start to introduce them six to nine months and we start to notice that the child has allergies to different foods. Uh, that's a that's already there a sign that, you know, there's a microbial imbalance. And we have that background of everything that mom struggled through, that she went through, um, in 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 not, you know, was we weren't able to optimize the microbiome from the beginning. And the kid is already showing um, these these uh, allergies to foods. Maybe the child from the beginning also had little signs of eczema and and skin rashes. So that that was another sign. Um, so these are all signs that the microbiome in the beginning. So the microbiome wasn't colonized optimally because it wasn't born through vaginal birth. 
the mom received antibiotics and therefore baby received antibiotics um, that, that, you know, crossed through the placenta. And then that, then um, you couple that with a formula feeding, uh, again, a lack of, of those um, beneficial microbes passed on from mom to baby. And then there's already a start to life when there's an imbalance in the microbiome. Then the microbiome is not communicating the right information to the immune system as the immune system is developing. So it's funny how the microbiome is matured by the age of two to three, and it kind of like parallels in a lot of ways the uh, maturity of the immune system, which ends up maturing around that time a little bit later as well. But uh, most of that maturity occurs in those first two to three years of life. So there's a lot of parallels between the microbiome and the immune system, and they occur very early in life. And I think the more that we educate moms from the beginning, hey, we can, we're, even if you had a C-section, even if you didn't, uh, weren't able to breastfeed, um, we can still do lots to optimize the microbiome and explaining these things to mom in a way that it removes the guilt from it because we all go through it, right? Nobody's microbiome is perfect. And in fact, there is no real perfect microbiome because it's so much determined by our environment and our genetics um, that we can empower them to really change the direction feel more comfortable, educate them on all of this and really get them, you know, um, making better decisions down the road when they're able to. Um, but yeah, I mean, the immune system, the microbiome's role in the immune system is very vast and, um, and it shows by how, you know, how close they are together physically in the body. And now for a very important message. Hey, veggie lover, if you are looking for free resources to guide you on your plant-based and healthy living journey, go to dryami.com forward slash free for tons of free downloadable PDFs. Hundreds of people have taken advantage of my tips to help them reduce meat and dairy consumption, navigate eating out, and build satisfying plant-based meals. Download one or download them all. And don't forget to share with friends and family dryami.com forward slash free. And now back to the episode. Wow. Yeah, that's super fascinating. And you're right. I feel like a lot of these choices or just circumstances that we end up being in with our children, our babies, our newborns, it's, it's like just the standard of society, you know? And so it happens so much that we don't realize that there could be a better way, or sometimes we don't have a choice that we can't do the other way. Just like you're saying, some moms may not produce enough milk or may not be able to breastfeed, may not be able to have a vaginal birth. So those are all things that we need to think about so that we can make choices further down the road to try to optimize that gut microbiome. You've mentioned already a lot of these, but what are some other early influence, early life influencers of the microbiome? So obviously the breastfeeding is like one of the hugest, biggest important factors, but what else is important to realize? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that um, one of the things that we all emphasize early in life is that skin to skin contact, right? So even if you're not breastfeeding, um, you can still have tons of skin to skin contact with your little one. And it should be dad and mom or, you know, any, any family that's available. That's really, really healthy for the baby. Um, because, you know, kids, uh, they're gonna like, they're gonna lick you. They're gonna like, uh, suck on your skin. Um, and, um, and that's incredibly healthy. Um, you know, early, really early in life, that skin to skin helps regulate body temperature, hormonal levels for mom and baby, and so many different, you know, health benefits to that. And I encourage moms to continue that skin to skin contact, um, you know, uh, for the first couple of years of life, because it's really, really be beneficial. So a lot of the microorganisms that we have on our skin will transfer the baby through skin to skin contact, even if they're not breastfeeding. So that's really helpful and beneficial. And we know babies are going to be touching us and then all of those, um, you know, and they're going to be taking their, their little fingers to their mouth. So that's also added microorganisms to their body. Um, 
having pets and siblings are actually a great, they're great influencers. Um, You know, if you have like, you know, little cousins, um, even if you don't have siblings, little cousins, um, it's, that's, that's all good. You know, obviously we're, we're a little bit limited now in times of COVID, but you know, in general, um, if we can do it safely, then that is, is something that we, that we recommend. Um, exposure to nature, the, one of the biggest, um, influencers, uh, early in life and really throughout, our entire lives is that exposure to nature. So they've done studies on kids in in like preschool where they will um, test their microbiome um, before the intervention, then have them do like weekly field trips to to a natural space, to a park, to a forest, and then retest their microbiome. And their microbiome greatly di- diversifies because we know kids are going to be digging their little fingers into the dirt touching all types of, um, of plant life. And then they're going to be taking that into their mouths. And, you know, if you feel like it's a safe space, you know, for me, and we'll, we can talk about pesticides and stuff like that. If I feel like it's a safe space where there's not going to be a lot of contamination with pesticides or anything like that, then, um, that is incredibly healthy. Like a forested area is not going to have pesticides, but fields may, you know, may be um, sprayed with pesticides and other chemicals. So I would just make a distinction between that. If you can find some natural trails, those are always great. Um, And even if you live in an apartment, you don't like, let's say it's the middle of winter, you don't have access to to a lot of natural resources where kids can be exploring outside or as an adult, then I say, hey, get a little pot and grow a little plant, right? We can grow a little plant um, on the windowsill and and really encourage the kid to to participate in it, um, you know, help put the seeds in, help uh, water it. And, and that, even just that exposure of that soil, of that, you know, organic soil, that natural soil that doesn't have any chemicals in it, is it's great. It's great for the child um, mentally, but also through their their microbiome. And it's so stimulating and educating um, to them to see like a new life form. Um, And so I recommend that, you know, I think all of us would benefit from growing a little plant, even if it's in a little pot in our windowsill. So um, those are great influencers. So we talked about siblings, we talked about pets we talked about skin to skin with loved ones and then going out into nature another one that we don't even think about that is an amazing influencer early in life and throughout uh, you know adulthood is exercise so studies show that um exercise diversifies our gut microbiome um diversity of the gut microbiome meaning more different species of the microbiome is what we want. That diversity is really what's going to create that balance um, that each of us needs. So diversity of the gut microbiome is associated with, you know, with exercise, um, with being two hours or more in nature, if we, you know, if we can, um, two two hours or more in nature per week. That is another. study that has shown to be associated with improved health um and and all the other things that we mentioned that's so great and it just makes me think of when you're especially when you're a new parent and you have this baby and you're trying to protect them from everything and keep them clean and you don't want them touching anything you know, potentially harmful. But really what you're saying is we need to do the opposite. We need to let our kids be kids and play outside and get dirty and explore their environment and be with different people and have pets and animals and things like that. Of course, there's precautions to take as always. But I think the point is that when we try to keep our environment too clean and too sanitized and don't let the child explore that this could potentially be harmful to the diversity of their gut 
bugs that they need to have to have a, a really well balanced microbiome, which I think a lot of parents, like I said, especially new parents are like, no, I don't want them to get dirty, you know? Right, right. I think, and you know, as an immigrant parent, um, you know, I was born in Cuba and um, we come from uh, an immigrant me mentality where cleaner is better. Yes, absolutely. You know, um, but we also have to realize what, you know, what it, what is too clean, right? So the studies show that there definitely is a difference when it comes, when you compare urban to rural environments. So people and kids that live in rural environments have greater diversity of microbes. Right. So that doesn't mean we have to move to the countryside. But if we do live in an urban environment, we have to realize the limitations of living in an urban environment. And we feel it right when we're stuck indoors with those um, white lights all day. We feel it like our body is not uh, as optimal. Right. But we realize that limitation and then we make an effort to um, get out, go take a stroll through the park like taking a stroll in a natural environment should be our goal every day. Does that mean I need it every day? No, it doesn't mean I need it every day, right? All, none of us are perfect, but that I do always have that in the back of my mind. Let's take a stroll. Let's even if it's 15, 20 minutes outside, let's try to do that. Um, because we know that that's optimal, not only for the gut microbiome, but that natural light is amazing. Um, that light goes into our eyes and <laughs> straight to the brain, and it creates positive um, connections. We know that exposure to na natural environments reduce, reduces anxiety and depression. These are studies that have been published study after study, and also re uh, reduces um, uh, incidence of like or rates of ADHD um, in kids. And, and even it's been associated with decreased rates of autism and other behavioral disorders. So it, there's definitely a lot of um, benefit to getting outside, even if it's a small space, whatever it is, whatever you have access to, but trying to make that happen. And if you couldn't do it, you know, today, try to try again tomorrow and things like that. But really get trying to get those two hours per week of exposure to our natural environment really yes. is the key, at least two hours. Yes. I think I think it's so important to remind listeners about that. I was just talking to a family this week. I've started this new thing where I'm trying to uh, integrate my coaching into my patient encounters a little bit more. And I feel like sometimes when it comes to habits, we want to go all or nothing. Like if we can't go hiking in the mountain, then we're just not going to do anything. But really that's not the way habits form. You have to start little. Say like maybe we can't go to the mountain this weekend, but we can go hike right here. Let's just go down the street. Let's just go for a walk to the park and back. So start with that. And then the weekends that you can get out of town or go somewhere different, then you can do that. But it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And what I love about habits like these their lifestyle habits, their lifestyle medicine habits. Just like you said, the skin to skin isn't just good for the microbiome. There is multiple studies that show even for like little preemies that that skin to skin improves their survival and their development and their growth or weight gain. So there's multiple benefits. It's like compound effect, right? Maybe you know that you need to improve your gut microbiome. So you're going to do some more of these things, but it's going to help you in so many other ways too. So I love all of these different habits. They're great. All right. So besides Absolutely. those, I know that there's other things we can talk about, particularly food, which is my favorite topic. So let's talk about how parents can foster a healthy gut microbiome. If they feel like, you know, their kids are relatively healthy and they want to try to just maintain that, what are some other habits that we can work on specifically food? What tips do you have for us? Okay. So first we have to start with, um, we have to start with breast milk, right? Because even though we're aware of the limitations a lot of moms have, we still have to state what the facts are. Um, breast is best for most kids, unless you can't, then you can't. If for whatever reason you can't, then you can't. And mommy and mommy's relationship with baby is the most important, right? So, um, but Breast milk really does have a lot of different components that is optimal for the gut microbiome. So let's walk through an optimal uh, a birth 
birthing story and and first couple of years of life so that the um, audience can can listen to what we can strive for. But if we don't meet those, that's perfectly OK. There's lots of stuff that we can do. So um, the best determinants of an optimal microbiome start with mommy being healthy. So, you know, if you're thinking about getting pregnant or you are already pregnant, this is the best time to optimize your health. That means um, eating healthy food. That means whole foods. And the more plant forward that you can go, the better. Why? Because the microbiome, um, the beneficial microbes that we talked about in the beginning, they use fiber. So fiber from plant foods, not from a supplement, but fiber from plant foods as their source of energy. They take the fiber that we eat, they use it, they ferment it, and then they create beneficial byproducts called short chain fatty acids. These beneficial byproducts um, circulate throughout our body and in, in, including they cross our blood brain barrier. Very few things can cross over to the brain and short chain fatty acids are one of these. So fiber is really um, something that we should all strive to, to get. And we get this from whole plant foods, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. So that is how mom should be eating predominantly, right? And then mom should try to exercise. Mom should, should try to um, get out to the environment and have, you know, lo- lower levels of stress. We know that not only in mom, but in baby and in the first couple of years of life, uh, stressful environments does decrease the microbiome diversity. Um, so, you know, optimal health in mom is really going to have a great start to baby's life. Um, and um, we used to think that babies were born sterile, meaning that they were born with no microbes anywhere, right? Um, but that's not true, actually. We know that now the gut microbiome crosses over through the placenta over to baby and babies are born already colonized. So that's why mom's microbiome is very, like optimizing that is very important to optimizing the baby from the beginning. Because let's say you had to go through C-section, let's say you had to take those perinatal antibiotics around, you know, birth. Uh, that's okay because the baby was already colonized through mom's placenta, right? So, um, so okay, so mom has optimized her health. She, this is optimal, right? Not everybody can do this, but we're we're thinking optimal case. Um, mom delivers vaginally. Vaginal deliveries are associated with in, improved optimal microbial microbial diversity because a lot of mom's microbiome will also transfer through there. Um, and then skin to skin right away. Then we put um, baby on breast. Baby gets to breastfeed predominantly. And then around, you know, no earlier than four months, but around that six to nine month mark, we start to introduce solid foods. So in that introduction of solid foods, um, we want to introduce foods that are whole plant foods as much as possible. The less processed, the better. Um, just like we talked about fiber being the fuel for the good microbiome, let's talk about some of the foods that are not so good and that actually feed the bad disease causing microbes. And those foods include refined sugars. Um, and we see that in everything. We see that in kids' cereals, even the baby cereals. We see that in a lot of kids' foods. Um, so refined sugars, high saturated fat, uh, foods, and, um, you know, those are the main ones and like sodas and and fruit juices, because, for example, fruit juices um, are, you know, if you they're store bought, they're not much different from sodas. They're pure sugar and they're they don't have any fiber. So I would stay away from refined sugars, um, sodas and saturated fat. Saturated fat is found in a lot of animal products like it's it's mostly found in animal products. So, you know, I would not feed kids like um, deli meats, um, and processed meats, because one, not only do they have a lot of chemicals, but they are high in saturated fat and you're going to be feeding the bad microbes through there. I wouldn't feed kids red meat, red meat and processed meats have been associated with, uh, different types of cancer. One of them being colon cancer, and they're considered to be a, um, processed meats are considered to be a type one carcinogen, just like smoking. So, you know, um, we don't want to be dramatic, but <laughs> feeding a kid deli meats would be akin to allowing a kid to smoke. 
Um, so um, I would stay away from refined sugars, saturated fats, and uh, try to feed as you're starting to feed um, baby and, and starting solids, m- more of these whole plant foods. Um, and they include, you know, these fruits, these vegetables, um, uh, then, you know, a little bit later on, uh, some grains, um, some legumes, and you want to introduce all the allergen foods too. So you, to me, you know, and every mom is different. Um, we're raising a completely vegan child, but I still have chosen to introduce these allergen foods in the appropriate time period. Always consult with your doctor, with your pediatrician about this. Um, but we did choose to uh, introduce these foods just to make sure that the, you know, that Emmy is not doesn't become allergic to them. The allergen foods are things like, you know, wheat, um, soy, which we naturally consume, but some of the animal products too, like dairy and eggs and fish we decided to introduce and again this is a personal choice but talk to your pediatrician about this because we know that shellfish and fish and like eggs are in a lot of different products and medications so um we want to make sure that our kids are not allergic to these so um when we want to optimize the kids uh, the baby's nutrition we really want to make sure we're talking to our pediatrician about when to um, introduce these foods, when to introduce allergens. And um, my, you know, the way that we did it is we introduced a new food every like three to four days. And we started with some soft foods like sweet potato, avocado, and then uh, little by little, you know, they'll soon be eating so many different um, foods. The goal is for adults and kids that once they're by that one year mark and you've gone through the process of introducing these foods slowly and mindfully under the direction of your doctor um, to get to a very diverse palate, right? Uh, To get to a very diverse um, uh, meal plan where, you know, every week you're going to be introducing, you know, feeding them a, a whole host of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. So studies show that 30 plus plant foods per week is really one of the determinants of a diverse microbiome. So it's not to be anal, not to go crazy about it. We, you know, we don't have to be OCD about it, Um, but it is something that we should strive for. You know, so if we didn't do it this week, okay, next week we'll introduce um, new ones and um, or some of the old ones that we already ate. So that's the goal, you know, once the baby has gone through the process of introduction of foods, um, and it's the goal for adults to be eating 30 plus plant foods per week. And that really is a determinant of of a diverse gut microbiome. And now for a very important message. Hey mama, if you are feeling frustrated about mealtime battles, worried that your child isn't eating enough or eating enough vegetables, afraid that your child is going to get some awful deficiency or disease because of the lack of diversity in their diet, I wrote a book that might be for you. A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy is available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook through all major online booksellers. Did you know that most children are born with the innate ability to eat the appropriate amount of food to satisfy their hunger and support appropriate growth? Despite this, parents are still anxious and confused about how much and what to feed their children. In addition, many children are labeled as picky eaters or develop behaviors such as hiding and sneaking food. There's also a growing epidemic of dieting behaviors and eating disorders beginning at alarmingly young ages. In my book, you'll learn the five pillars of healthy eating, how to apply intuitive eating through all the stages of development, lifestyle habits that support healthy eating and body image, troubleshooting and problem solving for picky eaters, overeating and dieting behaviors, how to create and foster a healthy body image in your children, how exploring your own body image and relationship with food will help raise an intuitive eater, and what foods to offer your child at different stages of development. A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy, available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook through all major online booksellers. 
Are you ready for a fresh approach to feeding your child? For more information, visit dryami.com forward slash book. And now back to the episode. I love it. And yes, I actually have two episodes on allergies in kids and introducing foods. So for the listeners who haven't heard that and you want to hear more information on that, um, it is one of those things, even the, I interviewed two experts, one of them vegan, one of them not. And even the vegan allergist said that she would recommend introducing these allergens just because you want to help decrease your child's risk of developing anaphylaxis. And I think all parents would want to do that. But of course, it's a personal choice and some people may still not be comfortable. For those that aren't, there are products available. So if you don't want to actually bring those animal products or you know contribute to that from the grocery store, they have even like these packets that have the proteins in them that you can put into like the baby's food and that kind of thing. So there are different options for your comfort level. I want to go back and clarify one thing because it's actually something that just surprised me. I did not know. So I guess I'm not up to date on my literature, but you're saying that the baby's gut microbiome starts to get established in the womb before they're born. Yep. That is something that um, for, you know, for all of, um, all of science, all of the life of science, uh, hundreds of years and decades, um, we thought that babies were born sterile, but that's absolutely not true at all. There's cross contamination of, um, gut microbiome of, uh, through the placenta. So babies are not born sterile at all. They're born already colonized. I'm not, you know, the studies don't show that babies are born with the entire microbiome that the mom has, but they are certainly colonized. So that opens up that door to mom's health really is so important. You know, we focus so much on the pregnancy and the baby, but no mom's health, that is really the determinant of health for baby. Um, and, and, you know, it's okay if mom you know, went into a pregnancy and wasn't very healthy, but now this is the time to adapt a lot of these habits. And, and, you know, the microbiome is so resilient and it's so fast changing. So for example, um, bacteria, they replicate every 20 to 30 minutes. Okay. So like, let's say E. coli, you know, they replicate every 20 to 30 minutes. And in 24 hours, we have 50, the new generations of microbes. So in one day, we have 50 new generations of microbes. So that means in 24 hours, you can really make a huge impact on your microbiome. So your past doesn't, and I love to say this, your past doesn't determine uh, your present or your future. So you can really just adapt, you know, and it doesn't have to be something drastic, but small and and consistent changes every day is really going to be so incredibly healthy for mom um, and, and baby. Um, so, so yeah, those are things that, again, the microbiome literature is so fast paced that I think we learned this maybe, you know, maybe one, like a year ago or like one or two years ago, but if, if we're not like on it, you know, this is my field. So this is like, I'm on it. I'm constantly on this stuff. Um, and if you don't know it, like if you if you're not up to date, then um, it's gonna pass you by. Um, but that's why we do this, right? To learn from each other um, and to uh, stay up to date, because it's impossible for one one expert to like be able to capture it all all the time. No, oh, definitely, and that's why I love it because I love talking about how important it is for pregnant mothers to be mindful about what they eat because babies taste in the womb and. I think that's one of those things that we probably didn't know for a long, long, long time. And it's so important. But now you're taking it a step further and saying, not only are they tasting what moms are eating, but mom's bacteria are passing through and starting that first initial colonization. And like you said, at the beginning of when we started talking, epigenetics, and we know that epigenetics determines so much for these fetuses, like the rest of your life starts to be determined in the womb, you know, like what you're going to look like and how much you're going to weigh and, you know, like how much risk you're going to have for diabetes. So of course, never to shame any moms. And like, I'm way done with my pregnancy. So I can't change what I did in the past. But for those of you that haven't become pregnant or still in your pregnancy, 
past the nausea and vomiting <laughs> and you can get some more of those greens and berries and beans, eat those beans and eat those nuts and seeds, get that good plant diversity, exercise, decrease your stress, get enough sleep. I mean, it's, it's important for you, but it's going to be a gift for your baby for years to come, for years to come. Um, the other thought that I had, which is funny because my brain works weird. I have like sitcoms in my brain, but whenever you were talking about how you know, these bacteria in 24 hours have gone through 50 generations. I'm thinking like we live at this one level and our bacteria are having like wars and revolutions and entire like soap operas, you know, like they're going through everything. So much is happening. And I have seen studies show that if somebody changes from a meat centric diet to a plant-based diet, things can dramatically change just in 24 hours. So for those of you out there, don't feel helpless. It's not gonna be taking years to try to make this change. You can start now little by little and really make a big impact on your gut bacteria. Absolutely. So that brings me to my next question. So if somebody feels like their child is going through all of these problems and they want to start making a change, like they feel like it's on the unfavorable side, then what kind of things should they do first? And I guess I kind of talked about this, but you're the expert. How quickly can a change occur? Yeah, absolutely. So the best way, for example, if we're taking a, a child that has these health issues, let's say they have skin conditions, they have food allergies, food intolerances. Um, and one, I always recommend everybody work with a registered dietitian that knows about plant-based nutrition that really is an expert at plant-based, plant-based nutrition. I work with two incredible um, dietitians that I recommend and they see kids and adults. So I would, you know, I, those are my go-to, but I'm sure each of us has one that we are comfortable with. Um, because it's important to navigate this, this, especially when it comes to food allergies and food intolerances, it's important to navigate it with somebody who's an expert on this, like in this field. Right. Um, but some general stuff that I recommend, um, for example, if your child is going through these issues, but they also don't have the palate to want to eat these healthy foods, I I recommend making things like smoothies and popsicles. Um, because, you know, what kid doesn't like popsicles? And um, most kids like smoothies and make it fun and make it something that is delicious for them. And I love energy balls because in energy balls, you know, you can do so, you can pack so many different nutrients there um, and kids see it as a treat. So they'll love it or like even cookies that are, you know, like oat based and you put all all like a bunch of seeds and delicious uh, omega three rich foods um, and high fiber foods. You can really make a lot of um, different um, quote unquote treats that are so healthy that are going to be diversifying their gut microbiome. So anything that you make into a smoothie, you know, you can usually make into a popsicle. Um, and in a smoothie and popsicles, you can pack so many different um, nutritious foods. So you can pack, you know, fruits, vegetables, uh, seeds. I, seeds are a major thing with kids because um, especially, you know, like chia, hemp, and flax seeds, they're rich in omega-3s. Omega-3s are um, healthy, you know, fats that kids really need to develop um, like neurologically uh, well. And, um, you know, I don't know how you feel about this topic, but I actually recommend all, you know, all, all kids, uh, be supplementing, especially plant-based kids be supplementing with, uh, algae-based omega-3s, uh, after they, they, they're, they stop, you know, uh, lactating, um, or formula feeding, um, because they're incredibly important for that neurological development. So I love to pack seeds and everything. Um, now Emmy, my child like eats seeds, like, like if it's candy, so I love it. Um, but I pack them in these energy balls. I put them in all his smoothies. Um, so those are my, you know, those like smoothies and popsicles and healthy cookies and energy balls are really my go-to with picky eaters because I feel like 
you can pack a big punch in a small in a small size and you're going to be feeding so many different species of those healthy gut microbes. Um, so that's how I would start it. And I would start it with a registered dietitian because I really think that that helps and it helps us, um, you know, realize a lot of things that we didn't, we didn't know. Um, this can be incredibly frustrating for parents, but I feel like if they have the proper guidance, it makes their world so much easier, you know? Um, so those would be my tidbits in, in terms of, nutritious foods that will diversify your kid's microbiome in picky eaters. If you don't have a picky eater, like our Emmy, he's not, he's not a picky eater. Um, so he eats a lot of different foods. It's not difficult, you know, and you can really, um, like Emmy will eat all sorts of beans, right? (laughs) All sorts of grains, all all sorts of beans. We do come from a Cuban American household, so beans have been his staple. That's another thing that you mentioned in terms of palate. Our microbiome really is well connected uh, to our palate. So, um, actually, some studies show that the microbiome are like our palate and our food taste actually is directed by our gut microbiome. We didn't talk about this, but there is a gut brain axis, but even more in depth, there's a gut brain microbiome axis. So, you know, our microbiome, we said the beneficial microbes, they're sending signals to the brain through these short chain fatty acids. It's asking for, it's not only sending different signals, but it's also asking for certain types of food. So if the beneficial ones thrive on fiber, it's going to be asking for fiber. But if the pathogenic or disease causing ones, we said they, they thrive on refined sugars and saturated fats, they're going to be asking for those foods. So you really have to clean out the adult and child palate if you've been incorporating a lot of these uh, foods that are uh, high in refined sugars and saturated fat. It does require cleansing. You know, we call this a detox, but it's really just cleansing, facing out these foods for healthier options. And then your microbiome is going to be changing rapidly, right? And sending those positive signals to the brain, requesting and and really um, having those, um, you know, the, uh, I, I can't think of the word right now, but like those, um, like requesting those healthy foods as opposed to requesting sugary sweets, right? Um, but but yeah, those are really quick, really quick changes that you can make um, in terms of food. And the other things that we mentioned, you know, increasing the activity level with your kids, the exercise level, and also um, getting out into nature. The other thing that we alluded to, but we didn't focus on is uh, stress levels. So stress levels are so important to be mindful of and manage appropriately, not only in kids, and but also in parents. I do get a lot of moms, you know, they're my patients, but then they'll talk to me about you know, different issues with their kids. And I feel they're so overwhelmed and so anxious about it. That does pass down, you know, to kids and they feel that. So they may also develop different, you know, different food anxieties. So it's important to, I I love baby led weaning. We didn't talk about this again. We can talk for two hours, but I think baby led weaning is really important when it comes to introducing a lot of these foods, because it allows the child to be uh, to have more control, have more fun with the food and create a positive relationship with food. So again, coming from an immigrant Cuban American household, I grew up in a household where they were spoon feeding me until I was like five years old and I had to eat all my food. And that creates a lot of food anxiety and a lot of, you know, a lot of different issues. So those are things that I have become mindful of and I'm trying not to pass down to Emmy. So I've loved enjoying, you know, baby led weaning with him and allowing him to direct, you know, offer him a large variety of healthy foods and he can pick and choose. And, you know, babies are great at telling us when they're full and when they're, you know, when they're still hungry. So I let him drive that bus. I'm not super laid back and, you know, (laughs) hippie about it, but I do try to be mindful of what is appropriate for his level. Oh, such great tips. I love all that. But basically what you're saying is in order to diversify our gut bugs and the diversity of our gut bugs is what helps balance them. 
we have to increase the diversity of the foods that we eat. And if you start with a picky eater, you know, there's lots of things you can do, but really from the beginning, just like when you started talking about introducing foods to your baby, I've completely changed my practices on how I recommend introducing foods now. And now I'm pretty aggressive with like, get started on those green leafy vegetables right away. Of course, well-cooked pureed. And I even have parents go faster now. One new food every day. You know, I'm just like, just get the, just baby flavor boot camp is what I call it. I want those babies to taste so many different things as quickly as possible so that their palate, their brain, their receptors are open. They're, they're welcoming all of these different flavors. So I love okay. that. And you know, whenever you're talking about our, our bugs directing our cravings, I've read studies about that and that's really, really creepy, but just like you're saying, we can starve them out because it's all about supply and demand. So even though you're having these bugs telling you that they want more fried food and sugar, you got to ignore them for a while and you eat less of them. It's not going to take very long before you starve them out and they stop asking because they're not there anymore, you know? And then you're going to have the ones asking for cabbage like mine do. Like seriously, I, when I haven't had enough like of my veggies after a couple of days, I'm like, like this desperate woman, like I need more veggies. Like, especially if we go on vacation, you know, and sometimes you just can't get the regular, like your raw veggies that you want. Like my body literally is asking for it. And then I get some and I'm like, oh, I feel better, you know? So you can, when, when you start turning those over, it all works together. It supports each other. So don't be afraid if you have the bugs asking you for fried food and sugar, you can change that. So it's all really great. Okay. So one question that's a burning question, and I feel like this answer changes every day is probiotics or no. And then the other question is, there's all these companies popping up now that you can send your poop into and they'll analyze it. And then they're going to like customize probiotics for you. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? What are your thoughts on these things? Okay. So I love all these questions. And I'm also going to touch on one last thing that we didn't talk about because we talked about antibiotics, but we didn't really uh, go deep into them. So, and it, it's kind of related. So basically don't be discouraged if you, um, you know, if you took antibiotics uh, around, you know, around uh, when you were pregnant or if you had to take antibiotics or give antibiotics to your child in the first couple of years of life. Um, we know that um, our microbiome has resistance genes, just like the bad ones have resistance genes, the good ones have resistance genes. That means that they resist a lot of being wiped out and it's called the resistome. So the genome for these resistance genes. And, um, you know, a lot of parents come really discouraged or even adults and they're like, oh my God, I had to take antibiotics. So one, I recommend because we also acknowledge that antibiotics are over prescribed in a lot of conditions that are, you know, viral conditions. So antibiotics are for bacteria, not viruses. So I always encourage patients to really ask their pediatrician, hey, is this, do we think that, the, that our child needs the antibiotics? Like, is this a bacteria? And if we think it's more viral, do we have to do antibiotics now? Always, you know, have that frank conversation with your pediatrician um, because I think it's important to, um, you know, differentiate because oftentimes as physicians, we, you know, we see the, pa the patients, they want something from us and we, may feel compelled to give antibiotics when it's for a viral condition. So again, antibiotics are needed in, and they're life-saving, but just have that conversation with your, your physician. Um, and the good thing is that we're not going to wipe out all of the, you know, all the microbes and the microbes are highly resistant, even the good ones to being wiped out. So just be reassured that we can get them back. Um, that was the first, you know, the first big thing that moms and parents worry about. The other one, probiotic foods. So our GI guidelines came out in June of, of 2020. So like six months ago, um, with these huge guidelines that we didn't have before, um, as directives in, to guide our therapy. And it, it was purely about probiotics. So probiotics, um, probiotic foods, first of all, are incredibly healthy. 
And again, work with your pediatrician to know when you can introduce them. But when you are able to introduce them, they're a great addition to these fiber rich foods. And a lot of probiotic foods are also uh, fiber rich. So they act as prebiotics, food for the beneficial microbes, as well as probiotics. Um, So probiotic foods are good and healthy. So when we talk about probiotics in general, we're talking about supplements and probiotic supplements in general, our GI guidelines are not recommending them for most conditions. Um, These are the adult GI guidelines, but the G uh, actually they're no, they're actually for pediatric and and adult too, because um, they don't recommend them for IBS, constipation, IBD, uh, heartburn, acid reflux. They don't recommend them for any of these conditions. They have three specific Uh, recommendations for probiotics. And these are patients with inflammatory bowel disease who've had surgery and have chronic inflammation of um, a pouch, which is a diversion of their their digestive system. So something called pouchitis. So IBD patients with pouchitis, they think that the benefits outweigh the risks. The second recommendation is in preterm or low birth weight uh, kids to prevent uh, necrotizing enterocolitis the probiotics are recommended. So that's actually the only recommendation specifically for kids. And then the third recommendation is patients who are at high risk of uh, contracting, if they're taking antibiotics, let's say somebody's taking antibiotics and they're at high risk of contracting C. diff. Let's say it's an adult that works in a nursing home or a child that, you know, is in a ward where they're sick and they have to take antibiotics and, you know, they have a high risk of getting C. diff then the benefits may outweigh the risk. So it's very, very specific. Um, this was after, you know, an expert panel, a huge expert panel combed the entire probiotic literature and said that we, at this time, we don't have enough data to recommend probiotic um, supplements in, in just general GI conditions and in the general population. Because as we mentioned in the in the beginning, our microbiome is so, so unique, like that, you know, that fingerprint, that thumbprint, um, that making a blanket statement for a probiotic supplement actually could cause more harm than not. So probiotics really should not be used in patients who are immunosuppressed, because we think that there is a trans- translocation of microbes. And even though we think these are beneficial microbes, that could actually be more harmful. Um, Each of us has that unique microbiome. I have have had patients who have come to me on probiotics um, with horrible symptoms. I take them off the probiotics and they improved immediately. So it's not a one size fits all. It really should be something that you discuss with your your, um, medical provider. And, um, and we really should be very wary of taking these probiotics when we know that there's a lot we can do in terms of lifestyle um, to uh, modulate our microbiome. And then at the end of the day, supplements are not FDA regulated like medications are. They don't go through the approval process, these clinical trials that deem that they are safe and that they're effective. They don't do that. The you know the FDA relies on independent or for these companies to regulate themselves. And honestly, um, I personally don't trust that. So um, so I would be very wary of that and really consult with your doctor to make sure that that's something that 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 would you know that could be beneficial for you. Yeah, and I thought that the most um, surprising thing that has come out with these experts really looking into these studies is that whenever you take probiotics or something like in pediatrics, one of the things that we used to very routinely do is prescribe them for antibiotic associated diarrhea. You know, like a kid takes antibiotics and they get diarrhea, take your probiotics. But that even in cases like that, it ends up restricting the diversity more than it would if they just went back to the regular diet and did their normal thing once they stopped taking the antibiotic. And I was really shocked by that because what happens is you're giving this massive dose of a few strains and sometimes it's only one or two strains of bacteria. And so then those kind of outnumber, compete 
with the other ones, and then you actually get less diversity. And that's definitely not what you're trying to do. What we're trying to do is increase the diversity, just like you were saying, restore that balance. So, you know, it's one of those things we learn. And when we learn, we change our practices. But I, I feel like definitely I was prescribing or recommending at least probiotics for a lot of these different things. And then once that came out, I was just like, oh, Okay, <laughs> so change yeah. our practice again and uh, see where the literature goes in the next few years. What about these companies that are testing the poop? So it seems like probably around the same lines, right? Yeah, so um, these uh, these big companies and even smaller ones, things like the most common one is like Genova. Um, they basically um, test our microbiome. The problem with that is that these tests have not been validated by any scientific study. One, because we don't have enough data on the microbiome at this time to really say this microbiome profile determines this. Like you have this. So we we, we were talking about like um the you know like the gene the like the gene studies like back in the 90s where we're decoding your your genetic material, your genome. Well now it's 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 pointing more to the microbiome, right? Decoding your your microbiome. Why? Because our genes don't determine our health, right? We have so many different things going on in our body that turn on and off our genes. So that's the idea of epigenetics. So microbiome is hugely um, uh, involved in this turning on and off de- uh, different genes. So now we're gearing towards decoding the microbiome and how that relates to, you know, to individual so that idea of individualized medicine we are legions from there we are so far from that um because each of us has a a completely different uh, microbiome so because we don't know what this microbiome profile is gonna mean for this person these tests don't mean anything so these tests um they when you get them they're like 20 pages long and they basically say oh you have all these microbes yeah, but so do so does everybody, you know. Oh, and you have moderate. Like I love to see the. Oh, you have moderate candida. Well, you know what? A lot, most of us have candida. <laughs> A lot of us have candida. It's one of the fungi that colonizes our 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 digestive system. It's part of our microbiome. That doesn't actually mean you have candida overgrowth, right? So we have tests that are validated like stool studies, uh, cultures, uh, ova and parasites, and Giardia and these things that are validated that, you know, gastroenterologists, pediatricians, and doctors run to make sure if you have an infection, right? But these other tests, the microbiome uh, analyses, don't tell us anything at this time. Um, We hope that in the future it, it will. Um, that's, you know, a, a lot of different labs are studying this and, um, but we're still very, very far away from it. On top of that, they're not covered by insurance again, because they're not validated and, um, uh, we have no way of interpreting them. And then what, what's the saddest part of all of this is that, you know, um, the people running these tests, they look at the test, they show it to the patient, and then they say, oh, that means that you need this supplement, this supplement, this supplement. The patient doesn't leave there with less than five different supplements that they don't need. So um, I would be very, very cautious of practitioners that are doing this because it's not evidence-based. Sub Again, supplement, if the, if the way to fix it is with supplements. One, how is that natural? Two, we said supplements are not regulated and we have to be very careful. If you need a supplement, doctors will be the first ones to prescribe it to you. But we don't just rampantly give out five supplements just because you have a deficiency in your microbiome. It doesn't work like that. And again, it could cause more harm than not. You know, things like, for example, a supplement of echinacea. There there are case studies that that has ramped up the immune system so much that it's developed, it's uh, transformed into an autoimmune disorder. So we have to be very careful with all of this. If, you know, if these tests are not validated, if we don't have the data, then we, and they're not covered by insurance, don't waste your money on this. Yeah, no, that's great advice. And I feel like what's difficult is that it's very tempting because a lot of these companies have great marketing and they're like, get your life back and whatever, optimize. And, you know, I think we're kind of, especially in the United States, very data driven. Like everybody wants to know their genetic profile and their 
you know, now we're doing continuous glucose. Now we're doing like, let's know every single thing. And so it's tempting to be like, well, what, what are my gut microbiome studies going to show? But then, like you said, the company is like, okay, well, this means that you need all these supplements and it could potentially do more harm than good. So just be very careful about that. That's kind of what I was thinking too, especially as more and more of these companies pop up that it's interesting maybe to know, but at this point, the applicability is probably not there for the general consumer. That's just the, you know, person wanting to know what, what bugs they have, who's living in there. All right. What do you wish more people knew about the gut microbiome? Um, so I would love people to know that they're natural and l- low cost methods that we can start doing from today that can have dramatic effects on our microbiome. We talked about exercise. We talked about fiber from whole plant foods. We talked about getting out into nature or growing a little plant. Um, we didn't talk about deep breathing and meditation that has a huge effect on the microbiome, a beneficial effect, and it's free. Um, so all these things that we can do to optimize our gut microbiome, I prescribe these to, to my patients. This is, these are my prescriptions <laughs> to my patients. And they, they honestly, and, and, and I also prescribe taking off a lot of supplements that are not needed. Um, and they improve uh, significantly and very quickly. You know, in two to four weeks, I can see very, very big improvements in, in their digestive health, in their overall health, and how they feel. Um, and that tells me that the gut microbiome is going in the right direction, diversifying and really um, uh, kind of like squashing the bad ones. Mm, I love it. So there's a lot you can do. And a lot of those things that you can do don't cost a thing. Doesn't even have, you don't even have to leave your house for some of them. But of course we do want to leave our house because we want to, you know, go out into nature and that kind of stuff. So great. Awesome. Well, Dr. Mendez, this has been so wonderful. If you could please remind my listeners, especially if this is the first time that they hear from you, how they connect, they can connect with you, where they can find you online and who would be able to see you in person if they wanted to do that. Absolutely. So I have a website. It is Dr. Dr. Vanessa Mendez dot com dr vanessa mendez dot com that's my website you can contact me through there i do have a health blog um where i publish a, ro- a lot about gut health and the microbiome um so definitely subscribe to that i do see patients uh virtually um nationally and internationally and uh through covid now a lot of states are allowing that so if you're interested in seeing me um, adult patients, then um, just shoot us an email and then my coordinator will respond. Um, and I'm also on social media through uh, Instagram known as Plant Based Gut Doc, Plant Based Gut Doc, and on uh, Facebook as uh, Dr. Vanessa Mendez or Vanessa Mendez. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And the last task I have for you today is to leave us with one call to action for the week. What is one thing that we can do this week to promote a healthy gut microbiome in our children? Um, okay, so one amongst all the things that I said, one call to action is um, to be empowered in the knowledge that we can influence our gut microbiome and therefore our immune and, and overall health uh, really quickly with just simple, simple, Uh, steps going back to the basics. Um, Be mindful, deep breathing, get out and explore nature and eat real whole food, mostly from plants. Perfect. You couldn't have said it any better. Dr. Mendez, thank you so much for your time today. This was a fantastic conversation. I know it's going to help a lot of people and, you know, we just probably need to have this and update it every year or two, because I know that the data is going to change very quickly and there's going to be new things to learn, but I really, really appreciate your time. And I hope that you have a very plantastic day. Thank you, Yami. And it's been a pleasure to be here and to be with all of you. And um, yeah, just know that as long as you're heading in the right direction, you're going to be feeling better. Hey, veggie lover. I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? 
please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.